Hola a todos, buenas noches, bienvenidos una vez más a nuestro webinar mensual. Hoy iniciamos con una, eh, una nueva serie de temas, empezamos con el módulo de trasplantes y recordando nuestra metodología, el primer lunes de cada mes invitamos a un ponente internacional a que nos comparta algo de su gran experiencia en, en estos temas. Eh, el día de hoy estamos eh, transmitiendo el doctor Raúl Guillén, vicepresidente de la sociedad. El doctor Luis Octavio Piedra Cruz es socio titular de hace algunos años y que nos va a ayudar también con la parte de la sesión de preguntas y respuestas. Eh, un anuncio nada más antes de iniciar. Hay que recordar que a partir del día de mañana ya se podrán descargar las constancias del módulo previo, del módulo que, que recién terminamos de mostaza y transfusión. Eh, Después de responder la serie de preguntas eh, que, que hicimos, es un mini cuestionario que nos exigen para hacer la constancia del, de los mismos, todo a través de congresos.tv diagonal smart y después de responder las preguntas se despliega la constancia con 10 puntos de certificación ante el Consejo Nacional de Certificación en Anestesiología. Y bueno, sin mayor preámbulo, vamos a empezar el día de hoy. Es, es un placer para nosotros contar con el doctor André de Nolt. Dr. Andrea Denault, welcome to our webinar, our today webinar. It's, it's un verdadero placer contar con él. Es un profesor muy reconocido a nivel internacional por eh, sus investigaciones, sus múltiples artículos de investigación original y que el día de hoy nos va a compartir algo que él ha desarrollado con su equipo desde hace algunos años. El tema del día de hoy va a ser el uso de ultrasonidos. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, okay, okay, sorry. Okay. Eh, el día de hoy eh, nos va a ayudar con un tema que, de sus investigaciones originales, que es el uso de ultrasonido en el, todo el cuerpo, es el, el POCUS y el whole body ultrasound, específicamente el, en el paciente eh, sometido a cirugía cardíaca. Doctor Denal, welcome to join with us with these webinars, and we will start with your lecture. Thank you for being here. at the University of Montreal, and I will be uh, talking to you about whole body ultrasound <clears throat> in cardiac surgical uh, patients. Uh, my disclosures are uh, shown here, but none of them are relevant to this talk. I'd like to take this occasion to thank and again to say hi to Dr. Rosenberg Alvarez Figueroa. Uh, miss uh, that being uh, with you in your country, and also hi to Dr. Alexis Munoz. This is a painting from 1568 by Peter the Eld Bruegel. It is called The Blind Leading the Blind. And um, if you look carefully to the painting, uh, this is me in the middle. In fact, this is how I learned medicine. And I like to call this evidence blind medicine. Victor Hugo, who's a French poet, wrote, an invasion of armies can be resisted, but not an idea whose time has come. Um, and this idea is the following. Life-saving decisions on critically ill patients should be only taken following careful history, physical examination, adding bedside ultrasound by the doctor in charge of the patient who integrates all the clinical information. This is the new way to examine patient. We call this a stethoscope. In 2020, Ram Singh and his uh, colleague reported the, the multiple application of perioperative point of care ultrasound. Those included optic nerve, examination, cardiovascular, vascular access, airway, pulmonary, and abdominal applications. In 2019, I was invited by the Korean Journal of Anesthesiology to write a review article on all-body ultrasound in the operating room and intensive care unit. What I found most useful in all-body ultrasound 
is to look at organ interactions. These are some examples of uh, organ interaction. For instance, brain and lung. So if you have elevated intracranial pressure and beeline on lung ultrasound, this is typical of a neurogenic pulmonary edema. On the other hand, a very common observation in cardiac surgical patient is heart and kidney, is the presence of RV dysfunction and renal venous positivity, which is typical of a cardiorenal syndrome. Alexander Calderon is a medical student working with me for this year and he's involved in research. What I would like to do in the coming up uh, slides is to um, show you the numerous application of using only a linear probe for whole body ultrasound. Simple linear probe, what you can do, you can use it for airway management, rule out intracranial hypertension, detect pseudo hypertension, to rule out and diagnose the pneumothorax, pulmonary edema, and COVID 19. And also, I think this is the fastest way to detect right heart. So let's talk about airway management first. So airway management um, is, uh, is uh, something at the heart of uh, our practice. And uh, ultrasound is the fastest way to diagnose esophageal intubation, to rule it out, faster than capnography. So when you use a, a, an ultrasound and you look at the left part of the neck, you'll easily identify the esophagus. But if someone is intubated, and the, uh, the endotracheal tube goes in the esophagus, you'll see it right away, even before you get a capnography signal. And that's well documented. The other application of airway, and there are more than these two, is uh, if you have a patient in which you suspect that uh, the intubation will be difficult, you can see, uh, the, you can identify the cricothyroid membrane and, uh, and uh, exactly identify where you would go if you need to do it. Airway. This was a study done on cadaver comparing digital palpation and ultrasound in the identification of uh, the neck anatomy. And uh, when the authors look at the injury to the larynx of trachea, you can notice that with ultrasound, uh, there was none too mild in 75% versus 26% in digital palpation. However, moderate to severe injury were much more common using digital palpation compared to ultrasound. The result of the study suggests that ultrasound guidance of the cricothyroid membrane and left lung marsh should be performed before airway management, particularly in patients with difficult palpable neck landmarks and difficult airway. A linear probe can be used to uh, rule out intracranial hypertension, and this is something uh, Jennifer Palermo uh, described in the Canadian Journal of Anesthesiology uh, this year. And in the paper, we basically described 10 simple steps how to use this uh, technique to uh, look at the optic nerve. So the optic nerve is an extension of the brain and it's easily seen uh, with ultrasound. This is the optic nerve attached to the ultrasound and an optic nerve has a sheet, uh, which is around 3.3 millimeter, a, a subarachnoid space, and um, uh, the optic nerve sheet is uh, three millimeter. Uh, the size of the optic nerve sheet is typically from four millimeter, we consider it pathological, uh, typically when it's more than a six millimeter, roughly. So this is an example of a patient who has acute uh, hemorrhage, a subdural hemorrhage. And when you look at the uh, optic nerve on the uh, right side, it's uh, slightly enlarged. But when you look at on the side of the hemorrhage, what you can notice is this is what you see is a tapiedema. So instead of being concave, it's convex. Um, so, epidemia takes some time uh, to uh, develop and also to resolve, but what's faster is an enlargement of the optic nerve. The optic nerve uh, uh, sheet, the optic nerve size, has a prognostic value in patients who have a cardiac arrest. Uh, this is a, a small study in resuscitation last year where they uh, took uh, 36 patients. The average age was around 52. 72% male, and the area under the curve of the optic nerve sheet 
was a 0.9. So patient with a good outcome at values of 4.2 plus or minus 0 0.6 versus 5.2 plus or minus 0 0.6. In patient undergoing cardiac surgery, we start, uh, we have some interest in looking at the optic nerve sheet. And this is an example of a 50 year old woman after aortic mitral valve replacement and tracheospinemuloplasty. And when we measured the optic nerve sheet, it was quite enlarged. And uh, in addition to the optic nerve sheet, this patient also had abnormal hepatic vein, a positive portal vein, a renal vein suggesting of uh, venous congestion, and also, as we will see later, a positive femoral vein. And this is important because one of the uh, concepts which is now um, accepted in the literature is what's called the cardiointestinal syndrome. And the cardiointestinal syndrome is basically the fact that when you have heart failure in your gut, you'll get gut edema and you'll increase your gut permeability, but you get also gut hypoperfusion because not only the mean arterial pressure is reduced, but the central venous pressure is elevated. So the perfusion pressure is reduced. And uh, this is a picture of a patient who died of um, mesenteric ischemia. And often it's not a localized process, it's just a diffuse process that we see uh, in the operating room or at autopsy. But before uh, you go to that stage, what will happen is that you'll get bacterial or lipoposaccharide uh, translocation. Then you'll activate your monocytes and macrophage. You'll release cytokines. And the cytokines will do several elements. So first, it will reduce your cardiac function. And this is something we see in septic shock. And septic shock is, is a cardiogenic shock also because you have myocardial dysfunction on the left and also on the right side. You'll get vasodilatation, which is also typical of a septic shock. But also what you have is that these um, cytokines will go through the blood-brain barrier and these patients will develop delirium. Uh, all the signs, all the clinical signs that uh, you can see with ultrasound have been reported by uh, William bourbier Soligny, He's one of my PhD students and nephrologist. And imagine what does he carries all the time with him when he do uh, nephrology consult. In fact, it's a portable ultrasound uh, system. So this is another example of a delirious woman, 56 year old, after aortic valve replacement. She has morbid obesity. And uh, you can notice um, uh, on this video that she has a uh, Encephalopathy, you know, she has asterixis, she has flapping. Uh, she is also having um, vasoactive support for post op vasoplegia. She's six kilo over, uh, and that's within 48 hours. And also, the optic nerve sheet is enlarged in her. Examiner, there's a portal positivity. And uh, interestingly, uh, 24 hours, there's no more portal positivity. There's no more, uh, if you look at the color Doppler signal, the color is uh, continuous, it just changed with respiration. Uh, before, her creatinine was 139. She was not an in and vasopressin. The next day, we removed six liters, creatinine went down. There was no more vasoactive agents, no more flapping, and her neurological condition improved. Okay? And um, this is because uh, when you uh, remove uh, fluid, you are treating the source of the problem which is the gut edema. And this was uh, demonstrated in a paper in The Lancet in 1999, where they measure endotoxin in patient healthy volunteers and heart failure with or without edema. So those with edema had higher endotoxin level. And what happened is that after uh, the, uh, you give them diuretics, you can see that the endotoxin level went down after diuresis. So basically the inflammatory response to bacterial translocation and heart failure with edema normalize with diuresis. Fluid overload is a significant problem in the uh, intensive care unit, as particularly after cardiac surgery, and it's something that our group has been aware uh, more and more. And uh, just to give you an example, in 1999, the average fluid balance intraoperatively was around four liters. Now it's around one liters, and we often see more and more patients arrive in complete uh, neutral fluid balance, and I can tell you that these patients do extremely well postoperatively. The next role of um, UBUS with a linear probe is to detect uh, pseudo hypertension. Uh, this is a, a picture of a patient who had, um, as you can see, several attempts of uh, radial artery uh, catheterization. Um, ultrasound useful when uh, you uh, use arterial lines. This is a systematic review meta-analysis of RCTs 
uh, using ultrasound guide catheterization of the radial artery. And uh, what they demonstrated is that your success rate or first pass, I would say the first pass success rate is significantly uh, better with ultrasound. And this was reconfirmed again in another paper uh, in 2018 in the Journal of Clinical Anesthesia. But what I found very um, useful uh, with ultrasound is to make you suspicious that the radial artery pressure is unreliable. And uh, this is something I've talked last year at uh, your uh, meeting. And just to give you an example, uh, again, 61-year-old man, the cabbage, mitral valve, uh, this is the femoral and this is the radial artery and this is the femoral and the radial artery two hours later as we're running off bypass. You see a huge difference uh, between the pressures and this patient brain saturation is completely uh, normal. And again, look at the difference in the pressure and how much you would manage differently this patient if you just have a radial artery. Uh, this is another example before bypass, simple cabbage case. And uh, this is the femoral, this is the radial, no big difference. The brain saturation is normal. And during bypass, okay, during bypass, the radial artery pressure is 29 millimeter of mercury. Nobody would just say, oh, that's just an artifact. But again, the brain saturation is normal. And you can see in this patient during bypass, this significant gradient that develops between the radial and the femoral artery. Okay. This is another patient in the ICU. And you see the same thing in the ICU in the hemodynamically unstable patient. Huge difference between the radial and the artery pressure and this is one of my colleagues who sent me our transplant patient she sent me a picture because i teach this to uh, to residents and she's now her colleague she was a former fellow and again you see huge difference between the, the systolic blood pressure so this is uh, probably a much more serious problem uh, than we can think of and every time you use a radio you always keep you have to keep in mind that if you have any significant hypotension, you have to question yourself, am I really treating the blood pressure? In 2016, we report our experience in ANA, and uh, you can see that this gradient up here before bypass, at the end of bypass, 5, 10, 20, 40, sternal closure. And we saw this gradient uh, defined as a systolic more than 25 or a mean more than 10 in 45% of patients. There's other studies coming up. This is one with, uh, uh, in which we measured the size of the radial artery and correlated with the uh, risk gradient. This was a study done by uh, Vincent Bouchard de Chêne, and uh, we measured the radial in 160 patients, three times on the right and on the left. And uh, we had electronic records where we measured uh, 150,000 measurements of the radial femoral gradient. So the gradient was present in uh, 35%. Uh, in, uh, and the duration of this gradient on average was 56 minutes. Okay? What uh, Vincent found is that if your radial artery is smaller than 1.7, uh, the risk that you're going to have a gradient is 50%. Okay? So the use of the ultrasound is not only to facilitate your technique, but also to know what type of radial artery are you dealing with. So this is a very pertinent information to know before you put a, a radial artery. But the other element also is that before you put a radial artery, maybe you should make sure there's no stenosis on that artery. And a simple way is just to put the linear probe on the radial or the brachial artery and look at the signal. So normally, when you interrogate an arterial signal, you'll have a triphasic pattern. You'll have a systolic wave and a reverse diastolic wave. Okay, so that's a normal pattern. And this is something that Evan Rutter reported last year. Canadian Journal of Anesthesia. So this is what it looks on the subclavian, the brachial, and the radial, and you can see the velocities go from 70 to 120. If ever you have a stenosis, okay, you see you don't have any diastolic reversal flow okay, in those patients, and the velocity signal are significantly reduced. So maybe one day before we put any radial artery on a patient, we will examine the radial artery or the brachial artery, just to make sure that we won't have this type of. Another application of a linear probe is um, to rule out or even diagnose a pneumothorax pulmonary edema in COVID. Guidelines for the use of point of care lung ultrasound have been reported in 2012. 
And two of these uh, guidelines are related with use of um, a linear probe, uh, or the interstitial syndrome. The interstitial syndrome is basically the presence of B lines or vertical lines that you can see in cardiogenic pulmonary edema, but also in fibrosis, ARDS, or 19. There is now a lot of interest in cardiac anesthesia and general anesthesia on the use of uh, lung. And basically, all these conditions which are clinically relevant, such as uh, condition mostly with air, like pneumothorax or interstitial edema, and liquid condition, like pleural effusion or pneumonia, can all be diagnosed with ultrasound with uh, quite a relatively good sensitivity and specificity. And most of these conditions uh, are, uh, the, uh, I would say, in uh, lung ultrasound is definitely better than chest radiograph for most of these conditions. This is what uh, it looks like when you do lung ultrasound. Uh, this is the ultrasound probe, the costal cartilage, the major pectoralis muscle, the pleura, the intercostal muscle, the thoracic muscle. And on ultrasound, you have the skin, the pectoralis muscle, the ribs, the transverse thoracic muscle just under. And this is a normal pleural line, and you can see the pleural line moves from left to right. The intercostal muscles are here, and this is an A-line, and an A-line is basically an artifact, a reverberation of the pleural line, same distance from the skin to the line. Uh, in uh, 2017, the uh, Colombian um, Journal of Anesthesiology invited uh, me to um, write this paper, which I wrote with uh, Colombian colleagues uh, from uh, Canada, and um, uh, in this paper, find this algorithm in Spanish uh, regarding how we use lung ultrasound. Uh, this is the English version, uh, but what I'd like to point you is that all these conditions, uh, except the pleural fusion and the consolidation, can be diagnosed with a linear probe. Uh, a very important uh, condition that occurs uh, regularly in cardiac surgery is uh, pneumothorax. It can be on the right, on the left, sometimes we see it bilaterally. And, um, and lung ultrasound is extremely useful to diagnose or to rule out this condition. Uh, if you and one of the ultrasound signs is called a long point. So if you put an ultrasound probe uh, on the top here, you're gonna have no sliding lung, okay? And you have no sliding lung here. If you put the ultrasound probe there, what will happen is that you see sliding lung over there. But uh, to identify the pneumothorax, what you want to do is to find the transition zone where you have a sliding and we have no sliding, no examples of that. So this is an example of a pneumothorax where you have a sliding and then there's no sliding. You see it again here where you have sliding and then there's no sliding. This is easy to see, you see sliding here and no sliding. And again, you see there's no sliding here and you see sliding appearing back and forth. And again, this is another example where you see sliding, you see B lines, and when you have B line, there's no pneumothorax. There's another way to rule it out. And here you just have A lines, okay, and you have no uh, B lines anymore. Well, the uh, long ultrasound for pneumothorax is not 100 sensitive and specific. And one of the reasons is that you will never get this sign if ever you have a, such a pneumothorax that there's no opposition between the lung and the chest wall. And I had such a case uh, recently. And one of the way uh, I use ultrasound in that situation is that I will um, basically always look at the diaphragm. So if ever there's no sliding lung, you look at the diaphragm right away. Because if there's no diaphragmatic motion, it means it's normal that you have no sliding lung and that could indicate endobronchial intubation or the, 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 the lung can be completely uh, fused against uh, the talx, and we've seen this in patients who had talcosis, uh, talc for the treatment of a pneumothorax. But when you have a, such a large pneumothorax, again, it's very useful, just find the diaphragm. And this is that case. And what you see here, okay, in the lower region, is that you'll see the diaphragm and the liver that appears. And what you see just beside this image is absolutely just A-lines. So basically what you're seeing here is a patient who has almost a 100% pneumothorax, and I like to call this the lung to liver point. So we uh, put a pigtail in this patient, and the uh, patient improved, and on the next 
use my pocket ultrasound. And again, I repeat the same image. And again, you can see now the liver. You don't see as well as the diaphragm because the, my, uh, my uh, V-scan doesn't have the same resolution as the other linear probe. But then you can see easily the sliding lung. You can see some B lines in this patient. And uh, you can see uh, how uh, the, the, the pneumothorax. In 2016, anesthesiology also has published a very nice uh, study where they use uh, ultrasound and compare it with auscultation to determine the endotracheal versus uh, bronchial intubation. And uh, with the linear probe, you can see the trachea, and you can see that the trachea uh, would change if you put an endotracheal tube. And you can see also the sliding lung. And uh, the time to complete this examination was uh, less than three minutes. And what they found is in the differentiating tracheal versus bronchial intubation, the sensitivity and specificity of scutation was 66 and 59 percent compared to 93 and 96 percent of ultrasound. And the gold standard was the use of a bronchoscope to make sure that the endotracheal tube was either on the right or on the left main. Uh, uh, this is an image of a patient, a uh, CT scan with uh, diffuse uh, lung disease um, and uh, with intermittent, uh, with area which are normal and not normal. And this has come from one of my colleagues in uh, uh, Quebec City, Dr. Langevin. And uh, what you see here is a gradual zooming of the peripheral aspect of the lung. And you can see the thickening here. And you can see there's plural abnormalities. And this is really uh, quite specific of uh, COVID-19. And COVID-19, you know, these patients can end up in the operating room and sometimes the diagnosis is not made. So ultrasound can be used if it typical uh, finding. So the sonographic signs of um, and patterns of COVID-19 have been uh, reported in a short communication by Volpicelli. And he mentioned that the bilateral patchy distribution of multiform clusters alternating with spared area is typical of the disease. So as opposed to uh, the um, uh, pulmonary edema where you have uh, symmetrical B lines in the interior uh, to a posterior region in a patient lying on their back, with the COVID-19, you'll see, uh, for instance, lots of beeline anteriorly, and then no more beelines uh, as you move laterally. And um, uh, one of the, the signs, in fact, any other ultrasound sign should be considered as intermediate probability and should lead. One of the signs, which is uh, quite typical of COVID-19, they call it the beam sign. Okay, so what you see is that suddenly you see this uh, beam a fused B lines. And again, it's you have just beside normal lung area. So this is quite 19. And uh, initially, the progression of disease in COVID 19 is uh, you just have lung sliding. And as it moves on, you get B lines that increase in number and distribution, multifocal, coalescent B lines. And then you have consolidation, error program, and rarely plural diffusion. And as the disease progresses, the lung aeration goes down, and the opposite will be seen. If the last part of this presentation is uh, how to use a linear probe to diagnose right failure. So this is a, a 72-year-old man transferred to Montreal Art Institute for Arctic Dissection. I took care of uh, last week. Uh, this patient had no past medical history except amidalectomy apnea. And he had an uh, aortic dissection with almost what looked like a pseudoaneurysm. On 3D reconstruction, you can see that this pseudoaneurysm was compressing partially the. Uh, uh, when you look at the femoral vein of this patient, uh, this is uh, the femoral artery and this is the femoral vein. The common femoral vein, you can note that it's positive. And this is not normal. Okay? A normal femoral vein should not. And if you put Doppler on, you see there's a, a significant reversal in the uh, signal. So the, the concept of peripheral positivity is not something new. It was described in a paper in Archive of Internal Medicine in 1925 by Kerr and Warren. And um, basically, what I'm saying is that uh, 
normally there should be no peripheral positivity in the venous system and this will appear only if the pressure is raised in at the right atria so this is a figure where you have the inferior vena cava stiffness and the inferior vena cava diameter and the peripheral pulse pressure waveform so there is the waveform is uh, very uh, small but as the stiffness and the ivc diameter increases then there will be peripheral transmission and increase in the pressure waveform in the this concept was reported in 1962 in circulation <clears throat> uh, 20 patients who had tricuspidary regurgitation they were found to have pulsating varicose vein and at that time they did not dog with their phlebogums but you can see the pulsatile signal of the phlebogum and the pulsatile uh, uh, varices uh, that you can see this so a pulsatile varicose vein is, is a clear sign of uh, right heart dysfunction associated with tricuspidary when you look at uh, what's been published on this uh, uh, pulsatile femoral vein and Doppler sonography, there's not too many paper, papers, about 930 cases, 13 studies, mostly in radiology journals, and it's typically observed during referral for a DVT. It can be found from 3% to 50% of the uh, population. And um, a normal femoral vein is continuous and has some respiratory change. And um, we can talk about the respiratory or cardiac modulation, but cardiac modulation is not uh, normal. Uh, if you use uh, or not an electrocardiogram, then uh, if you don't use it, people will describe integrate or retrograde uh, velocities. And this is typically observed whenever your right atrial pressure is elevated. So the first paper. Uh, describing this technique with uh, cardiac catheterization was done by Kakenbull in Geneva. And this is the uh, femoral vein Doppler signal. This is a positive signal, abnormal. And uh, what the author find is that they correlated the central venous pressure, those with a normal venous Doppler flow signal, and those with a positive signal. What you have in the black uh, dots are those with no signs of right heart failure. The white are those with signs of right heart failure, and the black square are those with valvular heart disease with ejection fraction more than 60%. And you can see that the threshold of 7 millimeter of mercury into the central venous pressure was a, a good way to differentiate those with or without signs of. Abu Youssef uh, uh, reported uh, in 1996 also his experience. Instead of using a threshold of uh, seven, he used a threshold of eight. And he reported um, 51 patients in which the right atrial pressure were measured within uh, four weeks and uh, correlated with. So uh, when you look at those patients who had a positive femoral vein, you can notice that the vast majority had elevated uh, right atrial uh, pressure, which gives a good specificity uh, for this uh, sign. Uh, and a positive predictive uh, value of 94%. However, the threshold to identify uh, what's the normal positile uh, velocity uh, has been uh, uh, reported initially by McClure. And um, what they did is that they uh, did a case control study. Out of 276 patients evaluated for DVT, they find nine patients with femoral vein positivity and nine controls. And the endpoint for that study was just to look at the chest X-ray and see if there was cardiac. And what they found uh, is the following. So this is a positile uh, velocity. And what you can see, uh, that's the integrate velocity, and that's a retrograde peak velocity. And when you look at the retrograde velocity peak, um, and you measure the one from the control group and the one with the study group which were which were uh, the patient with the enlarged uh, cardiac on the chest x-ray well the threshold of 10 centimeter per second of retrograde peak velocity had a very high specificity and a positive predictive value in detecting patient with abnormal cardiac 
So how do you do common femoral vein uh, Doppler examination? So position yourself the right side of the patient, select a linear probe, use the EKG if it's available, select on your probe the LEV or low extremity venous profile, and you perform a transverse, then a longitudinal examination of the right and then the left femoral vein. And I personally use a cardiology convention for whole body ultrasound. So when I use a longitudinal view, I always put the head on the right side. So it's done for um, so first, you do a 2D examination. You identify the arterial and the venous anatomy, and uh, you identify the femoral artery, the common, the bifurcation with superficial and deep femoral artery. You look at the femoral vein, same, and then you identify the saphenous vein. You compress to differentiate if it's a vein or an artery. You look at venous pulsation, and you look also if there's any thrombus or spontaneous. Uh, this is uh, how it looks like. So this is the external iliac vein, the common femoral vein. The first branch, uh, which is will be the superficial vein, will be the common saphenous vein. And then if you move down, you'll see the deep femoral vein and the femoral vein, previously called the superficial vein. This is what it looks on a transverse view with 2D anatomy. And uh, this is the common femoral vein. This is the great saphenous vein. This is a superficial femoral artery, and this is the deep uh, femoral artery. And I like to use the Mickey Mouse sign to describe this anatomy. So you see the two ears correspond to the arteries, the head to the common femoral vein and the nose vein. As you move down lower, you can see the superficial and the deep femoral artery between the superficial femoral vein and the deep femoral vein. So once you do the 2D examination, you move to color Doppler. Put your scale at 20 centimeters per second, and you will uh, you can use your color on a transverse view. Just make sure that you're not perpendicular to the vein, but you angulate your probe to 45 degree. But it's always better to look at on a longitudinal view. Uh, is the signal continuous? Is there respiratory modulation? Is there car this is a normal left femoral vein. You can see that the common femoral vein is continuous. And you can appreciate slight change in the intensity of the blue, which are the respiratory uh, modulation. This is a pathological common femoral vein. You can see easily there's a pulsatile uh, velocity. It goes from red to blue. And once it's done, then you move to pulse wave examination. And I strongly recommend to use a longitudinal view after the saphenous venous junction. This is where you do the interrogation. Uh, the advantage of using uh, a longitudinal view is that when you'll put your sample Doppler, uh, the uh, system will automatically correct for the angle. But you have to make sure that you have less than 60 degree uh, angulation. You'll measure the integrate and the retrograde velocity. And the exam duration for femoral veins will be less than a minute. And you would correlate this with uh, what we call the venous uh, excess ultrasound score, cardiac examination ultrasound. This is a normal femoral vein. You can see the continuous signal and some respiratory. And this is just Alexander Calderone is doing the examination. You can see first he goes transverse and then he turns longitudinally to get the image. And it is done. Okay, so it takes 20 seconds to do. This is a pathological uh, femoral vein. It's, it has cardiac uh, uh, modulation. But just to show you the difference between a longitudinal and a transverse view, uh, the waveform are relatively the same. However, the velocity will be lower if you use a transverse compared to a longitudinal velocity. But the aspect of the waveform will be uh, This is the uh, pathological femoral vein in a 56-year-old woman after mitral valve repair. Uh, you see that the signal is biphasic. And this patient, at the same time, had a portal positivity of 71%. Normally, the portal vein should be uh, continuous also. And the interlobal renal vein was also biphasic. It's, it's, again, a normal uh, renal vein should be continuous. Uh, this patient was uh, diuresis, and after diuresis, you can see that the femoral vein signal now is uh, uh, only positive, but it's not as biphasic as it was before. And the primal portal vein positivity goes from 71 to 
Uh, the use of portal vein and uh, renal vein are some of the studies that we've done over the last uh, few years. Uh, we were able to demonstrate that the portal possibility is in fact a sign uh, associated with right ventricular dysfunction and also one of the best predictor of uh, post-operative complication in cardiac surgery and also as you will see also delirium. And uh, Dr. Bobier Souligny demonstrated again in a similar study uh, that the uh, possibility of the renal vein also was a predictor of renal dysfunction. So this is a 69-year-old woman after mitral artery valve replacement and tracheospedal neuroplasty. She was unstable on day two. You can appreciate just on color doppler the possibility of the renal vein. And uh, this is the uh, hemodynamic waveform. So this is the pulmonary artery and right ventricular pressure in yellow. And just under is the central venous pressure. You can appreciate that during diastole, when the swan is pulled back in the right ventricular position, that the diastolic slope is abnormal. In fact, it matches the, uh, the uh, central venous pressure from the Y descent to the, uh, the X, uh, X wave. And uh, normally it should be completely horizontal, but then you can appreciate that there's a slope and the slope indicates the presence of right ventricular diastolic. So this patient, uh, unsurprisingly, had a very pulsatile common femoral vein. She had also flapping and uh, asphyxis that uh, I previously mentioned. This is often associated with this uh, sign of, uh, again, congestion. And uh, last year we reported a clear association between portal positivity and uh, flapping and also delirium uh, because these are uh, most likely signs of a congestive and uh, these uh, two examples are uh, the same day. A uh, 72 year old woman after cabbage, lactate were high. We look at the femoral vein and you can see that the femoral vein is continuous. So in this patient, I'm not thinking of a right heart dysfunction to explain the elevated lactate. I look at the heart and what I see here is a blood clot. So she has a tamponade and um, she just goes to the operating room. And the reason why uh, you don't see positivity in, in this patient is that uh, uh, the, the contraction of the right atrium cannot be transmitted to the femoral vein because of the denting effect of the uh, localized uh, pericardial uh, effusion. Just in front of this patient was another woman, a uh, 54-year-old, who had a pericardectomy. Again, the lactate were high, but in that case, there was positivity of the femoral vein. So I was suspicious of a right heart dysfunction. In fact, when you look at the um, uh, subxiphoid view, where you see the right ventricle in the right atrium, there was a tricuspid regurgitation, and this patient improved with uh, inhaled vasodilators and diuretics, and the lactate went back to normal. 64-year-old woman after AVR, she has the hemoglobin of 68, and often these patients are transfused without uh, being examined. Um, some of the time the transfusion doesn't change anything um, and one of the reasons is that if you transfuse a patient who is uh, congested uh, this condition might not improve and that might not, it might not be the best way to improve your hemoglobin. Uh, this patient when you look at the CVP waveform the X wave was uh, smaller than the y, y descent so it indicates that there's, there's some degree of RV dysfunction. The right atrium was dilated and the femoral vein that you can see on the transverse and longitudinal view and the portal vein were highly positive. So to get more fluid to this patient just to improve a number might not be the best idea. In fact, the best way to improve the hemoglobin in this patient is to remove uh, several liters of water and the hemoglobin will go up and then you won't uh, need to transfuse this patient at all. Uh, portal positivity as can be seen in many other conditions at uh, the University Hospital, uh, downtown University Hospital, where I was working until uh, last uh, June. Uh, we saw it in esophagectomy, in brain uh, hemorrhage, in uh, abdominal abscess, in pulmonary hypertension. So any situation with your right atrial pressure will uh, increase. Uh, Caroline Gabard uh, is one of my uh, former fellow. She works in Basel. And um, she uh, reported uh, the use of uh, a venous Doppler in COVID-19 patients. Uh, they start using it routinely. And uh, in that court of 20 patients, they saw it uh, in four patients. What they do when the patient is on uh, prone position, you can use the popliteal vein as an alternative and it works. Uh, 
Um, it was very interesting to note that uh, these uh, out of these four patients, three of them died uh, with, during their hospitalization, as opposed to none of the other ones without any uh, positivity. Uh, as you know, a right ventricular dysfunction has, is a bad prognosis. And uh, if present in, in any type of disease, uh, COVID or not, it's uh, associated with um, more uh, postoperative. So if we go back to our patient that comes in the uh, IC, in, was uh, admitted for RT dissection, uh, this patient back, uh, went to, to the OR. I remember that he had a positile common femoral vein uh, preoperatively. And at that time, before the operation, the portal vein was not positile. So the positivity was most likely related to a significant pulmonary hypertension, which was confirmed in the operating room. His systolic PP was 54, and he had mild RV dilatation. Postoperatively, he developed severe RV dysfunction. His PP was lower. And not surprisingly, uh, the femoral vein was, uh, was again uh, very positile. And this was also associated with portal vein positivity. Like any uh, ultrasound measurement, there's limitation is using the femoral vein. Uh, remember that you have no access uh, to femoral vessels in some patients, such as ECMO patients or those who have catheters. But you can use the popliteal, you can use the upper extremity, uh, which are alternatives. Uh, there's no transmission of positivity if you have tamponade, as we saw, inferior vena cava stenosis, like in liver transplant, or after any um, uh, after heart transplant also and uh, venous thrombosis. There's multiple mechanisms that can contribute to hemodynamic instability, and just looking at the femoral vein is not uh, enough. And if you have no femoral positivity, that doesn't mean that you give volume. And if you have pulse femoral positivity, it doesn't mean that you give uh, Lasix, okay? Because um, uh, you can have a pulmonary hypertension, you can have a pulmonary embolism, and the treatment uh, for this patient will not be uh, diuretics. Diuretics will be indicated if you have a volume overload. So basically, the presence of femoral positivity, or even the absence in the presence of an unstable patient, is just an indicator that you will have a better idea of what type of problem you will be looking for and moving to a more targeted ultrasound. So a very message, a very important message, at least, to, to always tell the residents and the fellow is never treat a number of an image but treat a patient. So integrate all the information before taking a decision on those patients. So I think femoral venous Doppler is probably the fastest uh, way to diagnose uh, right heart dysfunction because as you see, it takes about a few seconds and it's extremely useful as an important implication. And we're actually doing a study looking at uh, the sensitivity specificity comparing to right ventricular pressure monitoring. So if we summarize, uh, there's basically four patterns that you'll encounter when you do a Doppler of the femoral vein. One is an intermittent pattern that disappear with every breath. The second is a continuous pattern. The third one is a cardiac modulation. And the, third, and the last one is cardiac modulation with significant uh, reversal. If you have a pattern where the signal appears and disappears after every breath, that means there's inferior vena cava collapse and that suggests that the mechanism of hemodynamic instability is mostly hypovolemia or vasodilatation, and there's definitively no significant RV dysfunction that contributes to hemodynamic instability. If you have a continuous uh, venous pattern, but that doesn't change with respiration, that means there's an obstruction of the common femoral vein, but if there is respiratory variation, definitively there's no RV dysfunction. If you have a signal in which the peak reversal velocity is more than 10, or I would say 50% of the integrate velocity, or a positivity index more than three, this is a very uh, suggestive of uh, RV dysfunction. And then you can have this middle or uh, intermediate pattern where it could be either a normal uh, or a, a ventricle, a right ventricle recovering from RV dysfunction and then you will use all these elements below to clarify your process. So the key message I'd like to leave you uh, today is again, we need to stop evidence-blind medicine. Patients needs to be examined. Ultrasound is the fifth pillar of physical examination and we should examine our patients 
especially before doing any procedure or taking any decisions which uh, will are um, all these treatments that we use in cardiac surgical patients, inotropes, vasopressor, blood, fluid, okay, all these drugs are contraindicated in one situation, which is when you're not measuring the good blood pressure. And always keep in mind that the radial artery pressure in unstable patient is unreliable in one third of the time at least. We need to train our future colleagues on ultrasound. We need to start early in medical school. I even have a colleague who's a cardiologist, and when he was in France, he told me he even started earlier than me uh, training uh, students. So I think this is a very important message. We need to bring this to medical school so that the next generation will stop to do evidence blind. And finally, we train every year. We have this course, unfortunately, this year. Because of the COVID-19, uh, we uh, are we're unable. Uh, we will be not open to uh, people outside Canada. But uh, stay tuned because it's something that Rosenberg and uh, Alexi came. Uh, now we to teach ultrasound. Now we have new modalities like uh, virtual reality, and I think that will accelerate and improve our skills. So in summary. Physical examination incorporating bedside ultrasound allow assessment of the unblind unique anatomy and physiology of your patient. In airway management, ultrasound is useful to rule out esophageal and endobrachial intubation. It's useful in surgical airway. Examination of the optic nerve sheet allow you to rule out intracranial hypertension to suspect generalized venous congestion, and it could be potentially used as a prognostic biomarker. Arterial vascular ultrasound can allow you to make sure that you don't have any vascular obstruction and to suspect that you'll have an unreliable radial artery. Long loss sonography is so useful to roll out the pneumothorax, to diagnose interstitial syndrome, and to differentiate if you're dealing with a cardiogenic or non cardiogenic pulmonary edema, such as in COVID 19. And finally, I think femoral venous ultrasound is the best way or the fastest way to roll out RV uh, dysfunction. This is my uh, research team. Um, many of these uh, uh, research projects uh, would, uh, would not be possible without their uh, country. Gracias por su atención. Thank you very much, Dr. Denal, for this uh, fabulous uh, presentation about uh, the use of ultrasound in all of our patients because it is so important to do in, in every patient. It's a very punctual situation about the useful or all the things that we need to do in, in all the patients. Uh, we'll go to, to the questions session. Vamos a ir a la sesión de preguntas. ¿Tienes algo, Raúl? Eh, we're going to ask, we're going to make some questions to you, Dr. Donald, and we're going to wait for them. That's okay. Raúl? Eh, estaba revisando, perdón. Eh, no, todavía I was no. Checking, sorry. Not right now. Ok, este, no sé, no. ¿tú tienes alguna pregunta? Yo tengo una pregunta yo, personalmente. Eh, doctor Donald, eh, how can you eh, measure the portal vein eh, or versus, can you measure the portal vein flu with the transesophageal echocardiogram? Echocardiogram, can you um, measure? Yeah. In, which, in which window can you see, in which view can you see? Right. So, uh, do you hear me well? You hear me well? Yes. yes. So, uh, so um, we've uh, reported in the, the study Reportamos by en un Hayek in the British Journal of Anesthesia uh, en el British years Journal ago. De Hace uh, we described the technique Describimos using transesophageal echocardiogram to examine the portal vein. Uh, Para examinar fact, la vena portal. We're actually doing an international study 
Estamos en un estudio internacional alrededor del mundo y tenemos que explica tres formas para interrogar la vena portal a través de la cardiografía transesofágica. Le voy a mandar el link al doctor Rosenberg. Una de las técnicas es usar lo que llamamos transgastric abdominal ultrasound y hacerlo a través de, de transgástrico. So, as you move along the inferior vena cava, okay. uh, por, si te mueves a la vena inferior, cava inferior, of the inferior vena cava, and as you move toward the, the liver, you'll see the portal vein. Y si te mueves hacia el hígado, verás la vena portal. At around 70 degrees. And then, degree, sorry? around 70 degree, 70, 50 to uh, 70 uh, degree uh, from the uh, longitudinal IVC view. Uh, what's very important is to make sure that your velocity is reduced to the first scale velocity at 20 seconds per second. Otherwise, you won't see the color signal. Okay. The second technique that you can La do is follow the aorta. Seguir la aorta. Until you see the celiac trunk. Hasta que veas el tronco celíaco. And then, as you advance el... under the celiac trunk, y si te mueves por el tronco celíaco, you'll see it's going to split in a splenic artery. In a splenic... Vas a ver la arteria esplénica. Esplénica, perdón. Mm -hmm. And under the splenic artery, y por debajo de esta arteria, okay. That's the second technique. Esta And the la third technique. Y la tercera? A transgastric view, 90 degree of the left ventricle. Transgastrica, 90 grados. And then you just rotate to the left. Y solamente rotas a la izquierda. And at the left, beyond the stomach. Y por, por atrás del estómago. Is the spleen. Se encuentra el vaso. You open the color Doppler at 20 centimeters per second. Doppler okay. color a 20 centimeters per second. And then you can get the splenic vein. Y vas a encontrar la vena. So the success rate with transesophageal echo is 25% using one of these three views. Mm. Es alta usando estos tres views. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, thank you very much. I get it. I'll send you, if you send me an email, I can send you the three videos that we've made with the simulator. Si quieren, okay. después les envío los videos de las tres técnicas que estoy describiendo. Okay, I will send you an email and if you could send me, I will appreciate it. My pleasure. Octavio, ¿tienes alguna pregunta? Sí, eh, te, me acaba de, me, me llegó al inbox eh, acerca de la pulsabilidad de la de la, de la femoral que, estuve, que estuvo diciendo el doctor eh, Penot y nos comentan que si eso se puede estar utilizando a la salida del, de la de circulación extracorpórea o solo lo está utilizando en la unidad de, de cuidados intensivos. Eh, somebody asked me, what do you think about the use of the femoral pulsability? after uh, the peripulmonary bypass. Do you use it for it or just in the intensive care unit after the surgery? Okay. Uh, we, uh, because as anesthesiologists, we don't have access to the femoral vessel, okay? So that's the reason why we don't use it, okay? Uh, however, por lo mismo de la cirugía, pues no, no tenemos tanto acceso a, 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 a la parte femoral, pero, okay. so that's why I use it when the patient arrives in the intensive care unit. Pero lo utilizo en la, en la, en la UCI. So, if ever the patient arrives and he's hypotensive, okay, si el paciente and, llega y lo encuentra hipotenso, and the femoral vein is completely flat, y la, la, la vena femoral está completamente plana, there is more suggestive of es más sugestivo, hypovolemia or vasodilatation. Pero de otra manera, 
biphasic and positive. Si veo que hay mucha pulsabilidad, this would be you would have to be very careful with giving more fluid. Muy cuidado para dar más fluid. Because he has right heart dysfunction. Porque tienen una disfunción del corazón derecho. On the other hand, also, what I, I teach residents and my fellow, también lo que yo les estoy enseñando a los residentes, is to look very carefully es que to the muy cuidadosos pressure waveform. A la forma de las de, de las ondas que nosotros podemos apreciar. Because normally the central venous pressure waveform. Porque normalmente la forma de la de, de la de la curva de la PVC is less than four or five millimeter. Es menos de cuatro o cinco milímetros. When you have right heart dysfunction, cuando tienes disfunción del del corazón derecho, you have a big V wave. Tienes una onda muy grande B, una onda B muy grande. Or, or a significant Y descent. O un, una descendente de la eh, Y, de la onda Y, este muy, muy grande. And this indicates that you y have esto indica que tenemos disfunción. So you combine the and you Así combine que combinas the lo hemodinámico con lo que se observa en el ultrasonido. And then you can also examine the portal vein, the renal vein, and you'll see se checa, of right heart venous congestion. Y se checa lo que vimos de la, de, de la vena femoral, de la vena portal, para tratar de, de, de llenar un diagnóstico de cómo se encuentra la función cardíaca. Is that clear? Thank you. Creo que tienes más preguntas, Octavio. No, 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 no. Tengo, sí. Bueno, hay, hay eh, pregunta al doctor Fernando Rios. Ask uh, doctor Fernando Rios about for monitoring patients undergoing cardiac surgery, do you prefer femoral cannulation over radial or only in case of a radial artery with a diameter less than 1.7? So, in our experience, uh, in our experience? Okay. Uh, I use both radial and femoral. Uso tanto radial como femoral. Okay. And the reason is that when the patient arrives, it's much y la simpler. Razón es, y la razón es porque cuando llega el paciente es más simple. Just to put a radial in a peripheral vein. Ponerla en, en la arteria radial. Okay. And once they are asleep. Y una vez que, que ya nos está funcionando la, la arteria. We put the central vein and the femoral vein on the ultrasound. Colocamos tanto eh, el acceso central como la línea femoral con ultrasonido. We use a very small femoral catheter. Utilizamos un catheter muy pequeño, muy delgado. So that the patient can be mobilized. Para que el paciente sea movilizado después de la cirugía. And if the patient, and if the patient arrives in the intensive care unit, and there's no gradient, and there's no y more dentro drop, de la UCI no hay este, tanto, tanto diferencia. We remove the femoral. Y lo hacemos a, a nivel de la femoral. When we do the femoral, you look at the anatomy all the Cuando time. lo hacemos a través de, de, de femoral, lo usamos a, este, por, por anatomía la mayoría de las veces. If there's Checamos any, la anatomía. If there's any plaque, Stenosis. Okay. You will look at the other side. Okay. You always si checamos que hay una placa o estenosis, nos vamos al otro lado o tratamos de interrogar el otro lado. But if there is any danger, you will not put it. Y si no existe el riesgo, pues se, se coloca. Okay. So, and our experience is that it is hard to predict who will have a gradient. Who will have a gradient. Y en nuestra experiencia es un poco difícil decir cuál es el paciente que va a tener problemas con, con los gradientes. And that's why I would say all my colleagues who are, I would say, 45 and older. Por todos mis colegas que son de 44 años o mayores. They put both radial and femoral all the time. Siempre ponen tanto femoral como radial en, la en todos los casos. The younger one, los jóvenes, 
They will use both in big cases. Solamente utilizan las dos eh, las dos canulaciones en algunos casos nada. Más. But a simple cabbage, sometimes they just put a radio. Y en algunas ocasiones nivel <laughs> radial. What we saw, we compare. We did a study and we compare patients who have just a radio versus y a radio un, e hicimos un, un estudio en donde comparamos estas técnicas. So the radio, simpler case. The y la radio, radial es para los simples, para los casos más simples. The radio and the femoral, complex case. Y utilizamos en casos complejos tanto la femoral como la radial. But there was no difference in the Pero no hubo diferencia. The drugs the no hubo diferencia en o los resultados fueron muy parecidos en, en ambos grupos. But the radial group used more than the pero pero el, el, el uso de fenilefrina en el, en, el, en el acceso radial fue mucho mayor que los pacientes que se utilizaron en, en, en ambos, en femoral. And in the ICU, they were four hours longer on vasoactive drugs compared to the other group. Y en este tipo de pacientes se notó que el uso de vasopresores fue cuatro horas más que el resto o que el, o que el grupo control. So, we think it's more safer for the patient. Y pensamos que es mucho más seguro para los pacientes utilizar ambos. Because it's very hard to predict which patient will have a big gradient. Porque no podemos eh, predecir cuáles son los pacientes que van a tener mayor gradiente. Last week we had a patient. La semana pasada tuvimos un paciente. 110 kilogram. De 110 kilogramos. Big radial. Una radial muy grande. Ejection fraction 30%. Fra una, fra una fra del 30%. No difference in the radial and the femoral until after bypass. No tuvimos ninguna diferencia hasta eh, el, el, la circulación extracorpórea. But after bypass, the difference was 65 millimeter of mercury after bypass. Pero la diferencia de eh, posbomba fue de 64 milímetros. So that's why we have this practice. Es por eso que nosotros tenemos esta práctica de utilizar los, los, los dos accesos. And because the old guy have been burned more often than the young guy. Porque en ocasiones, pues el, el, el que es más, más grande es el que tiene la rosa. Yes. Doctor Donald. Dr. Donald, uh, do you know if another group around the world use the same uh, use the same thing that, that you? They put both arteries? Do you think that, it, and, or do you know if another group around the world? In yeah. Mexico City, we didn't use, we don't use. I have to say I use, but not, like I am younger than 45, <laughs> I use in some cases, not in all cases, but I will change my practice, I promise you. Yeah. Doctor well, Renón, eh, ¿sabe si algún otro grupo eh, en otra parte del mundo utiliza esas prácticas a comparación de, de cómo ustedes lo están haciendo? Porque en nuestra práctica clínica diaria aquí en México no lo utilizamos. Yeah. En algunos when, centros. When you look in the literature, there are Cuando groups, checas en la literatura, hay grupos. There are groups over the world that have shown the unreliability of the radial artery. Han, han visto que eh, no existe tanta validez de la, de la cateterización de la arteria radial. There are some center, uh, Hay algunos like centros. Cleveland and the Mayo Clinic, which en I la Mayo think Clinic, a brachial. Que utilizan la arteria brachial. And the reason it might work because the brachial is bigger. Y la razón probablemente es porque la brachial es más grande. But nobody has studied The brachial versus y nadie the ha estudiado la brachial contra la femoral. So even when we use a brachial, we use y aún así cuando utilizamos la brachial, también utilizamos la, la femoral. But it's, uh, we don't have a, a, a long series, but my experience is about no that mucho series, get, pero, 15 to 20%. You'll Pero en mi experiencia es más o menos el 15 al 20% el uso de esta técnica. Yeah. 
but that's my experience. It has mixed feelings. But I think it's a much, it's an underappreciated problem. Pero creo que es un problema muy subestimado. And it explains why patient. Y esto explicaría por qué los pacientes. They need vasoactive drugs after cardiac surgery. Utilizan vasoactivos o utilizan muchos vasoactivos después de cirugía cardíaca. For unexplained reason. Por razones que no nos explican. Thank you. ¿Tienes más preguntas, Arturo? Sí. Eh, nos preguntan, ¿qué recomienda en una canulación femoral en disección aórtica tipo A? We have another question, Dr. Denault. Uh, what's your recommendation in femoral canulation when you have a patient with aortic dissection type A? Yeah. So, what is very important is to, uh, when we have aortic dissection, we will typically... Que eh, en un paciente de estas características, con disección aórtica. Two radio. Radio, on the right, radio on the left. Canulaciones en la radial derecha y la radial izquierda. Yeah. And then we will examine the femoral. Y de, posteriormente examinaremos la, la, la femoral. And we would use and make sure that the dissection does not involve the femoral artery. Y debemos estar muy seguros que la disección no involucra a la arteria femoral. Okay. And this will be discussed with the surgeon. Y será discutido con el cirujano. Because sometimes he may want to use one of the femoral side. Porque en algunas ocasiones quieren utilizar también ese, ese acceso a los cirujanos. Depending on the, the extension of the dissection. Dependiendo también de la, de la extensión del, de, la, de la disección. The other, uh, the other uh, elements that you can use to la otra evaluate que se puede utilizar para evaluar, uh, the perfusion of a limb, okay, la perfusión del, del miembro, is that you can put, you can take your oximetry, uh, es que electrode, pueden tomar su oximetry, su oximetría, and put it on the four limbs, y colocarlo en los cuatro miembros superiores e inferiores, get a value before you start. Y tener un valor antes de iniciar. And then you will know if there's a place where the value will be unreliable. Y se darán cuenta que hay un, hay un sitio en donde no puede ser muy seguro. Last uh, dissection I had, the patient had the dissection that went down the left subclavian. En el último paciente que, que, que me tocó participar estaba en la subclave izquierda. So, When I put the art radio line with ultrasound, y cuando puse I, la arteria radial con ultrasonido, I was ex in the lumen. Estaba en el lumen. I had no flow. Pero sin flujo. So then I went on the other side, and this is Por why. Por lo tanto, me fui al otro lado. Yeah. Okay, so don't you you don't waste time. You don't waste your time with y, ultrasound. Pero, Por lo tanto, no perdemos el tiempo y lo hacemos con ultrasonido. ¿Tienes alguna otra, Octavio? Sí, tengo otra pregunta. Nos preguntan, ¿monitoriza el flujo de la arteria cerebral media en cirugía cardíaca y con qué aparato? The, ne the next question. Do you check the medial cerebral artery flow in cardiac surgery? And what device do you use it? Do you, do you use for it? Okay, so uh, I'm the uh, only anesthesiologist in my group who Soy el único anesthesiologo who en mi grupo transcranial Doppler que utiliza Doppler transcranial in all my cases. En todos mis casos. Okay. And uh, it's, a, uh, it's a portable, uh, it's a portable system. Es un um, sistema portable. And the way I use it y la forma en la que lo utilizo Is that I take a handheld ultrasound? Es que utilizo un poco este de gel en el, en el ultrasonido. And then I scan the brain to find Ajá. where the acoustic window. Para tratar de buscar una una ventana acústica. Then I know exactly where to position the transcranial. Y por lo tanto, ver eh, y checar dónde colocar el, el Doppler transcranial. Okay. 
Because if you don't see the skull on the other side, if you don't Porque see si the no brain, ves el escalpe en el otro lado, you won't have a signal. No tendrás ninguna señal. Okay. So the success rate. La tasa de éxito. And we reported this in the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia. Y lo hemos reportado en el, en el Journal Canadiense de Anesthesia. It's about 95%. How many, sorry? 95%. Es de 95%. You see at least one side. En al menos un lado. And it's about 75-80 on both sides. Y aproximadamente el 75% en ambos lados. Okay. So the, the transcranial Doppler is very useful. Y el Doppler transcranial es muy útil. When you use it with brain oximetry. Cuando lo utilizas con oximetría cerebral. Because if you have brain desaturation. Porque si tienes una desaturación a nivel cerebral. And it's a flow problem. Y es un problema por flujo. The Doppler signal will go down. El Doppler se va hacia abajo. Systolic velocity will come down. La, la velocidad sistólica se va hacia abajo. But if you have brain desaturation. Pero si tienes desaturación a nivel cerebral. From venous congestion. Por congestión venosa. Then the diastolic velocity will come down. La velocidad diastol diastólica disminuirá también. The systolic will be normal. Y la sistólica será normal. Like intracranial hypertension. Como en la hipertensión intracranial. And the other role of transcranial Doppler. Y el otro papel del, del Doppler transcranial. Is to detect emboli. Es detectar émbolos. So if, so in our experience, we're writing up our experience. But the more emboli you have. Y entre más émbolos tengas the more likely you're going to have problems. Es que sea más común que tengas problemas. Such as right heart dysfunction. As, este, como lo es la eh, disfunción del corazón derecho. But the good news Pero is las buenas that noticias, if you have right heart dysfunction from air, es que si tienes una, eh, una disfunción del corazón derecho, ahí, this, is, this is transient. It can be reversed. Es, es eh, pasajera y puede ser revertida. But if you have right heart dysfunction, but no air emboli. Y si tienes disfunción del corazón, eh, pero no, no, no observas ningún émbolo. That means there's an occlusion of the right coronary artery. Es que hay una oclusión de la arteria coronaria derecha. Which is mechanical most of the time. Que es mecánico la mayoría de las veces. And then often you have to go back on bypass and do a bypass on the RCA. Y tienes que regresar a circulación extracorpórea y hacerle cirugía. So this is how we, how I use transcranial Doppler. Y es como estamos utilizando el Doppler, el Doppler transcranial. Doctor, which handheld uh, did you, the, do you use uh, most of the times? Which device? Do want, yeah, do you want to translate? Eh, ¿qué, ¿Cuál es el aparato que utiliza la mayoría de las veces? Ajá, ajá. ¿Quieres decir eso, Rosenberg? Yeah. El portátil. Um, I use the, the V-Scan. Okay. Okay. Utilizo el V-Scan. Yeah. And, uh, but now uh, there's the butterfly. That Pero ahora on, existe el, el, el sistema butterfly. Which is very uh, much less expensive. Que es mucho menos caro. What, but now what the good news is Pero that... Pero ahora la buena noticia es que... The cost of all the ultrasound devices, the handheld, es que todos los, el costo are, are coming down. Se están, se están haciendo más baratos. Yeah. So eventually, it will be part of, you know, uh, it will be your stethoscope. Every, every doctor. Y en algún punto será como nuestro estetoscopio. Todos los médicos tendremos un butterfly. Yeah. The, uh, I would say, um, The, there is now even portable ultrasound which are wireless. Podremos decir ahora que ya existen sistemas que son completamente portátiles. Yeah. So I think the Sin best cables, way is to try them, but now there's a large market of different uh, devices. Y existen muchísimas marcas de distintos eh, aparatos. It, and it becomes a personal choice 
y debe ser de, por decisión personal. Gracias. Okay. ¿Hay una pregunta más, usted? Sí. I have another question. It says, what's your opinion about Doppler ultrasound to evalu evaluate acute kidney injury, trans-up or post-up? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, okay. uh, if you are interested, we wrote a paper. Si estás interesado, hicimos un, un artículo. A review on in the Journal of uh, Cardiovascular and Thoracic Anesthesia. En el Journal de Anestesia Cardiovascular. On how to evaluate renal function with, with ultrasound. En cómo evaluar la función renal con ultrasonido. Okay. What is very important. Lo que es muy importante. Is always to make sure that there is no obstruction. Es siempre estar seguros que no hay una obstrucción. Okay. Every week there is a foley that is obstructed in my ICU. Sí, eh, todo, el, todo el tiempo nos observamos que hay una obstrucción en la foley, en, en la sonda foley. Okay. Then the next step is to look at the kidney. Y lo siguiente es observar eh, el, el riñón en sí. Okay. And you want to make sure that the kidney is not congested. Y debes estar seguro que el riñón no se encuentre congestivo. Okay. So you can measure the venous Doppler and you can puedes measure medir, the arterial Doppler. Puedes medir a través de Doppler la, la vena renal. Okay. And what we found is that if you have a pulsatile venous signal, y si eh, observas nuevamente la pulsatibilidad at the cortico-medullary junction en la unión cortico-medular en la unión cortico-medular this is very specific for venous congestion of the kidney es muy específico de la congestión de, del riñón those patients will typically improve with diuresis estos pacientes típicamente van a mejorar solamente con, con diuresis. They will deteriorate with fluid. Y por lo tanto se deteriorarán si, si, si les colocamos fluidos o líquidos. And then what you can do is y por lo tanto lo que puedes hacer siempre confirm the congestion in the liver, in the spleen and in the femoral vein es eh, confirmar la congestión en hígado, vaso y a nivel femoral. And this is called the Vexus score. Y esto es conocido como el Vexus score. And it means venous excess volume with ultrasound. Y es conocido como exceso de, de volumen en, en ultrasonido. So if you go on, and it was described by uh, Dr. Bobien Souligny, who is the nephrologist I mentioned. Y es eh, a través de un nefrólogo este, que hizo esto, este, este estudio. So, uh, so there's, a, there's a website now just on Hay the un Vex sitio web. Score. Hay un sitio web solamente para el, el VEX score. That explains how to do it. Que explica cómo realizarlo. Perfecto. Creo que son todas las preguntas. Eh, ¿Usted tiene ¿Sí? alguna duda? Mas? Yeah, no. Yeah. I have, I have a lot of questions, but um, <laughs> it's not possible to to realize all now. But I, I have one question about the the when you measure the flu, the renal flow, uh, can you measure during cardiopulmonary bypass, like uh, I don't know, like uh, uh, to know if you are in correct flu during the cardiopulmonary bypass, I know that the flu would, will not be pulsative, but maybe the velocity could indicate if you are giving a correct perfusion if, or if you need to increase the flu in the centrifugal bomb or something like can you do. I don't know if the even the um, cerebral flu, I don't know if during cardiopulmonary bypass could help you to be to be better with your perfection? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, 
most of our studies, we um, the kidney, you can look at the left kidney during bypass, okay? The right para, is more para Durante la circulación extracorpórea es más aconsejable hacerlo por, eh, o examinar el riñón, el riñón izquierdo. The, um, it is not as easy as the portal or the splenic vein. No es tan fácil como la, la vena portal okay. o esplénica. But, and, and during bypass, we have, uh, we have not done any studies. Y durante uh, circulación extracorpórea no, no hemos hecho estudios. But we have some good case report to tell you. Pero tengo muchos casos para, este, para contarte. Okay. So I had one case. Tuve un caso. Who had a beautiful view of the kidney. Que, de un paciente que tuvo una vista muy bonita del riñón. And the patient goes on circulatory arrest for... Y el paciente fue a arresto circulatorio. Okay. So, before the circulatory arrest... Y antes del arresto circulatorio... At a mean arterial pressure of 60... Con una arteria, este, con, una pre, con una PAM de 60... There was good flow in the kidney. Hubo un buen flujo en el riñón. After the circulatory arrest, después del arresto circulatorio, at 60, con 60 de pa, there was no flow in the kidney. No hubo flujo en el riñón. So then I increased it to 70. Así es que la subí hasta 70. No flow. Sin flujo. 80. 80. No flow. Sin flujo. And then at 90, y the hasta que llegué a 90, reopen. El riñón se reab, el, el, el flujo se reabrió. And then I brought down the blood pressure. Y posteriormente bajé la presión. And the kidney was still perfuse. Y el riñón siguió perfundido. But that's just one case. Pero solamente es un caso. So, so maybe there is a kind of opening pressure in some of these patients, and this is something y I saw. This is something I saw. Y tal vez exista alguna presión de apertura y eso fue lo que yo observé. But n equals one. Pero n equals solamente uno. Okay. Maybe maybe the kidney flu could be the window to the correct uh, cardiopulmonary bypass pressure. Maybe maybe we need to. That's a good question. But I think we can examine the Pero kidney. Pero creo que podamos revisarlo y el riñón. And that's a good, that's a good, that would be a good, that's a good research question. That's y eso sería research. una muy buena pregunta de investigación. But one element that we found also. Pero uh, un elemento que nosotros encontramos también. Is that the emboli. Es que los émbolos. They go everywhere. Se van a cualquier lado. Including the kidney. Incluyendo el riñón. Okay. So in the paper on how to examine a kidney. Y en los artículos de cómo examinar el riñón. In the Journal of Cardiovascular and Thoracic Anesthesia. El Journal de Anesthesia Cardiotoracica. There's a picture where you see air emboli in the renal artery. Hay una imagen donde hay un émbolo en la arteria renal. Okay. So, if ever you don't use transcranial Doppler during si bypass. No un Doppler transcranial. To monitor for emboli. Para monitorizar émbolos, you can put your, your TEE, puedes colocar el eco transesofágico on a hepatic artery, splenic artery, en la arteria hepática, renal artery, and you just arteria renal, you look at the Doppler signal, y solamente ves los signos por Doppler. If you have emboli, si tienes émbolos, you'll see it right away. Los verás de cualquier modo. But with the transcranial Doppler we Pero can quantify the emboli. Okay. Podemos cuantificar los émbolos. You cannot do this with the. Y no lo puedes estar utilizando o no lo puedes usar con el eco transesfágico. Yeah. So that's that's and we did not realize this until we start using transcranial Doppler. Y no nos damos de cuenta de esto hasta que empezamos a utilizar el Doppler transcranial. Wow. Very interesting. Muy interesante lo que nos acaba de decir.
y como lo ha, lo ha estado diciendo, creo que sería una muy buena línea de investigación para, para seguir. I think it's a very good line of investigation for the future. Absolutely, absolutely. And for sure, if ever you have gradient, radial and femoral gradient in Mexico, please si let me know. Gradientes, por favor, háganmelo saber. Yes, we have, I, I'm, I made a little um, review in um, 10 patients, no, uh, like 15 patients the last year, and we put both femoral and radial artery, and uh, but only in complex cardiac cases. And okay. we found uh, it was a preliminary study. I wanted to, to do the study this year, but it couldn't be possible. But in 16, 16 patients, we found in complex cardiac surgery, 70% of present of gradient. 70%? 70%, yes. And then seven zero, eh? Okay. Yes, yeah. seven zero, uh, more or less, yes, more or less. And then, yes, we have great impression in Mexico. Okay, good. Well, I, I, I don't feel alone anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will send you I will send you the the, the, the study that we made. Yeah. It's we presented a uh, cartel in the SCC the last year, the, this year, but was virtual. Yeah, I will yeah, send so. you, I promise. And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very feel much. Good. <laughs> feel good. Feel <It's... laughs> good. In Mexico uh, we have gradient. Great. Well, In Montreal, we have them also. <laughs> In Montreal, también los tenemos. Oh, by the way, by the way, one procedure cierto, at the other hospital where I used to work. En otro hospital donde solía in, trabajar. In lung, in lung transplant, they do it for every case. Lo hacen por, por en, en todos los casos. Because they've been burned for a lung transplant with, with pseudo hypotension. Porque so, eh, se ha notado que, que, que cursan con hipotensión. So it's 100% of the time. And when you see these patients, the sicker they are, the more likely they will have the gradient. Y lo más seguro es que en este tipo de pacientes, pues van a tener el, ese gradiente. Okay. Bueno, creo que son todas las preguntas por el día de hoy. Dr. Donald, thank you so much for... Uh, help us to this uh, fabulous webinar. It's uh, amazing uh, all the things that you are uh, constantly review and do it in every patient. Uh, all the time uh, it's maybe the most uh, biggest or the biggest uh, 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 things to do an ultrasound in every in every patient, not only in cardiac surgery, but only in the in all the the critical care patients. We need to to know and do more for our, our patients every day. I uh, soy completamente convencido que este tipo de conocimiento nosotros podemos eh, reflejarlo en cada uno de nuestros pacientes críticos, no solamente en cirugía cardíaca. Y es la intención de que nosotros eh, podamos conocer y tener una práctica cada vez más cercana a lo que se está haciendo en el resto del mundo, ¿no? No quedarnos con, con los conocimientos eh, que tenemos eh, hasta ahora para poder desarrollar la cirugía cardíaca, porque siempre lo he hecho de la misma manera, sino que realmente demos un paso adelante eh, para asegurar el mejor pronóstico y el mejor manejo de todos nuestros pacientes. Eh, no sé si ustedes quieran agregar algo más. Pues no, agradecerle, no, no. Al, nada más agradecerle al doctor, agradecerle este, a Octavio eh, que nos apoyó ahora con la transmisión, este, y agradecer a todos eh, la, su participación. Igual recordarles que pues, estas pláticas se quedarán ahí para poderlas repasar o revisar. Y lo de la, este, no sé, Rosenberg, eh, cómo quedó lo de la, en la subtitulación. Ah, sí, este, los subtítulos no, no pudieron quedar el día de hoy. Eh, por un detalle técnico, pero en la semana ya esta plática se va a subtitular y van a poder accesarla eh, sin ningún problema. Eh, les recuerdo que a partir de mañana, eh, los que tengan su constancia pendiente del módulo del mes pasado podrán eh, entrar a congresos.tv-smact.
hacer el mini examen que está disponible y eh, se despliega la constancia en automático con 10 puntos de recertificación por el consejo. Estos 10 puntos son por módulo mensual, les recuerdo. Y, eh, bueno, un aviso que, que ya lo di un poquito la vez pasada, a través de un convenio que, que cerramos en conjunto con Seminars in Cardiothoracic and Vascular Anesthesia, tenemos para nuestros socios vigentes un precio preferencial de 500 pesos por la suscripción anual. Entonces, eso tiene que ser a través de la sociedad. Cuando se renueve la vigencia, eh, se nos avisa que se quiere tener esta, esta preferencia y nosotros hacemos la inscripción eh, en grupo, ¿no? Este, es la inscripción por un año y, bueno, algunas otras, algunas otras preferencias que vamos a tener eh, para publicaciones, incluyendo la el convenio de colaboración que hicimos con la Sociedad de Avance en Transplantes, en Anestesia en Transplantes, también para, una publicación, para publicaciones en su journal e intercambio de profesores para los cursos. Eh, todo lo, toda esta información, pues bueno, van a estar en nuestras redes. Y no queda otra, no queda otra más que agradecer otra vez al doctor Denault. Octavio, ¿me ayudas, por favor, a despedir al doctor Denault? It's been a pleasure to listen to you. Oh. Merci beaucoup. Y la été un plaisir de vous écouter como toujours. <laughs> Je m'excuse, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm having my Spanish classes, so okay. I'm still having my Spanish classes, I'm working on it, but I spend too much time learning ultrasound more than <laughs> Spanish. <laughs> Pasa mucho but, más tiempo estudiando ultrasonido que español. Better for yeah, us. <laughs> but don't give up, I don't give up. Uh, Pero no me rindo, no me rindo. More Spanish. <laughs> uh, en algún día that. lo haré en español. <laughs> Muchas gracias a todos. Gracias por acompañarnos. Buenas noches. Buenas, Buenas noches. noches. Buenas noches.